So today we're finishing Super Eye Patch while professional wrestling is stupid and beautiful and I love it. Last time around, we got the fiction that wrestling is all hardcore and real that apparently people believed into the 90s and believed. Note the air quotes. Apparently that was intentional and also completely accurate. So most people knew it wasn't real, but they just decided to turn their brain off. It's like, oh, no, it's, of course it's real. As opposed to now where it's not real and it's still good. Hell, this is a Super Eye Patch Wolf video that doesn't make me question morality or the existence of life in this universe. And it's a nice change of pace, damn it. So I'm taking it. Otherwise, you guys know the deal. Below, link, hit it up. Let's get started. When you begin to look into the industry of pro wrestling for long enough, a strange thing starts to happen. Like, and that is that what? the line between what's real and what isn't gradually begins to blur. And you begin to see moments when the fictional world of kayfabe and the actual reality of the business begin to bleed into one another. Oh. And identifying the point where one starts and the other ends becomes nearly impossible. Wait, so there's actually times where people started acting out on what they actually thought rather than to the script. Or are they just really good at blending it? It's probably the second one, but I'm worried he's starting the first one because with all the stunts they're pulling, getting too into it could probably kill... Did someone die? You know, I just went on about how this was wholesome. Please don't make that wrong. Please don't make that wrong. And to show this, we need to go back to the curtain call. The curtain call and its shattering of kayfabe was seen by many of the wrestlers and staff within the WWF as an appalling attack on wrestling. And so really? there had to be punishment. Someone had to pay the price for this transgression. It couldn't be either Scott Hall or Kevin Nash, as they had both already left the company. Oh. And it couldn't be Shawn Michaels, because he, at the time, was the current WWF champion, oh. and already a problem Too in popular. many other areas. And so the entirety of the blame fell on Paul Levesque, an upper mid-card wrestler with a lot of potential who seemed bound for greatness. And as punishment, his entire career was derailed and he found himself at the bottom of the card once again, being forced to endure a string of humiliating losses in matches that showed him as weak and ineffective, with other wrestlers shrugging off his attacks and quickly and easily defeating him. Writing like this is devastating to a wrestler's career. Oh, see, I was thinking, but it's just his scripting. He's going along with it. It's just following what they're telling him to do. But then I remember, oh, wait, no, no, no. There's still that thought in the process that people want to root for the people who they think are strong. So if you write someone to be weak, they're interpreted as weak by the audience. So the audience won't get into them. They won't buy the figures. They won't support them. And they're less of a draw, which also kills their career because they're still trying to draw attention in person. So it's literally a case of we're going to punish you by writing you weak. So you have to act weak. And if you don't act weak, you lose your job because you quit. And you can't do that because this is your job. And they probably have it a contract somewhere because... Frankly, there's contracts that are absolutely draconic if you look at some of the shit that happens. Mostly I'm referring to stuff later on with a certain guy who abused the fuck out of it. But I'm not going to go into that right now because I don't want to think about things like that. It destroys the fictional credibility a wrestling persona has Which is the, the only persona's credibility there is. And therefore severely damages their ability to draw a crowd and thus earn a living wage. Yep. But this was the new reality that Levac faced none of this was part of and the since actual he's told WWF to do it he has to or even mentioned on tv from the audience's perspective all that was happening was levac was a wrestler who used to win a lot and then suddenly stopped now let's take a moment that came four years later oh at this point levac had sweat and bled his way back to the top of the card and had been reborn as title contender triple h and in an interview that was meant to be kayfabe triple h is he going against Triple H or is he Triple H? Honestly, I don't know because I don't know nearly enough about wrestling. Also, is Triple H a title or a person? There's probably someone out there who's a wrestling fan going, how don't you know this? Not a wrestling fan. I only know it through osmosis. That was meant to be scripted. This happened. What? Hey, watch your lines. What? You, you want me to shoot with this interview? I'm going to shoot with it. It's about four years ago. He got fired for this, didn't he? Like, not even written out of the show. Like, he just disappeared, and they probably hid this footage as most of they could. Ugh. Because he's talking about blurring the line, and this is blurring the line. Because he's mad because they're actually screwing him over, cutting his pay, and doing things that, frankly, if it wasn't for probably being in the contract, he could probably sue because this is unfair retaliation. This is a literal crime. He could probably sue, but there's probably stipulations in the contract, meaning he can't. 
which are its own right entirely questionable, but that's something you need to hire a much better attorney for. And considering you can't pay the attorney nearly as much as his employment company can, <laughs> you lose. <sighs> this actually bugs me. I don't even know this guy, but the idea that just it's so blatantly unfair that they're fucking someone over because they broke script and then spent years on it. Okay, a couple days, a couple, maybe even a single year. Sure, four years? Enlistment terms in the military sometimes go shorter than that. Not, not intentionally, but they do. He's referring to things that really happened. And so ask yourself, who is actually speaking here? Is it the fictional wrestling persona Triple H? Or is it the actual human being behind the persona, Paul Levesque? Very much the, the person. person who had to actually endure. Oh, so he was rebranded as Triple WWF H. Okay. For years and nearly saw his career ruined. And the answer nearly. is that it's both. It's both Triple H and Paul Levesque. Oh. And the result is that there's an honesty and an anger that's genuinely captivating. Like honestly, I'm expecting him to punch the, reality the guy. Reality starts to. Kind of hoping for it too. And there are dozens of incidents like this that have taken oh. place throughout the years of wrestling. The Montreal Screwjob, the forced retirement and recent return of Daniel Bryan, and possibly, most infamously, the CM Punk pipe bomb, in which former wrestler CM Punk took to a mic and verbally rendered the entire WWE, laying waste to the management, his fellow wrestlers, and even his own fans. I have no idea what this is, but I want information. I'm literally going for the drama on this one. I usually don't chase drama, but it just sounds so incredibly juicy. I'm making an exception right now. I'm barely promoted. I don't get to be in movies. I'm certainly not on any crappy show on the USA Network. That's but not a bad thing. But the fact that Dwayne is in the main event of WrestleMania next year, and I'm not, makes me sick. Are they cheering or booing? Let, let me get something straight. Those of you this to me is what's so unique. Oh, that is... Di How many people have done that? You know, probably a lot. Uh, that is just... It's like... I, I have mixed feelings of that. On the one hand, fan having something signed? Yeah, that's cool. Finding out that they were just hawking it to sell on eBay later, it just renders the entire thing kind of... Ew. It's like, I get it, and hey, if you gotta hustle, you gotta hustle. Do what you gotta do. But it does also kind of leave a bad taste in my mouth, because... It just kind of highlights they're not there for him. He doesn't have fans. He has people using him is what it would feel like. And it, it doesn't feel good to be used. So I, I don't even know this guy, but just on what he's said so far, it feels like that's the biggest stab right there. Not even everything else. And like pointing out that he's kind of thrown away, but that even the people who are ostensibly the ones who are rooting for him are rooting to make money off him. That just... Damn. That's just kind of soul destroying, man. Uniquely captivating about wrestling. Out of all really just forms of entertainment in no other is the line between fiction and reality so delicate and malleable. Where the fourth wall is so fragile, and when it does finally give way, it can lead to some of the most intense and oddly sincere storytelling in any form of entertainment. And that's actually something that he's talking about right now that is actually integral to fiction as opposed to nonfiction in writing. I wasn't expecting to pull out the, hey, I'm an English major card today because wrestling. But with all the talk about how it's so much fictional and scripted, I probably should have guessed that. So yeah, this entire thing, this aspect of seeming reality is important. And the way you establish it is by using true events. You make people believe something by showing them something real to make them believe something false. But to do that, you have to know what is real to show them what is real, to build up reality within a fictitious narrative. So what he's saying is literally very important because it's just highlighting that the people who are scripting this are very much aware that they have to be cognizant of how things are going on. They have to bring in true things. They can't just go over the top fiction. They can, but if they only do that, then the audience becomes too aware of it and it breaks that suspension of disbelief. And when you break that, it can still be enjoyable, but it's less so. So to build it up, they were doing this. They were letting people air grievances. They were letting this happen. Or what I'm probably guessing is more likely to happen. 
They were working it in when people broke the script that they could work it in. Hell, that entire break of the WrestleMania where they all came out and hugged each other, if there had been anyone who just thought of a way on the spot to incorporate that into a new narrative, it probably would have been perfectly fine, but it was just too much of a surprise and they weren't going with it. A single warning to the right person who would let it happen, if there was anyone who would let it happen, might have fixed it because working in reality would help. Although maybe at the time they didn't have to worry so much about what was real as opposed to what they made people believe is real, so they didn't have that kind of stuff on hand. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I really want to read up on wrestling's history now to see how they manage that expectation. That is not something I was expecting today. Might have to do that. As fake as wrestling can be, these are the moments when it becomes shockingly real. Mm -hmm. These moments show something else also, and that is that at its heart, wrestling is just a story about people. No matter how theatrical a wrestling persona Walking is, at its core, it's just a person. One as real and flawed as anyone else. And when you start to watch wrestling for long enough, it's the stories of these people that become the main draw as you watch them grow and age and change. So to conclude this video, I want to talk about one of these stories. I want to talk about the saga of the Golden Lovers. What? Our story begins in 2008 as two young wrestlers wage war on one another. The first is Kota Ibushi, a young, supremely talented Japanese wrestler who sees Wrestler, yes. Roundhouse kicking. Although holding back enough that he didn't make contact. Because if you actually did, you could probably break someone's stern and maybe do it right. But details. This is, with subtitles, so is this a covered version aired in Japan? I'm pretty sure it's Japanese, not Chinese writing. I sometimes am wrong. Or is this the Japanese wrestling side? Which, honestly, I only know due to Ladybeard being on Trash Taste. Which, admittedly, is pretty damn epic. But I wonder if that's going to cross over there seems bound for greatness, and the other but... is Kenny Omega, a Canadian wrestler who, after seeing tapes of Ibushi's matches, felt destined to face him, and but... so he issued an open challenge to Kota, which Ibushi accepted, and so Omega travelled to Japan, and a showdown took place that was messy, brutal, and mesmerising. Ibushi eventually took the victory, but it didn't matter. Over the course of the match, the two wrestlers realized something. There was a connection here. Both wrestlers believed that wrestling could be more than just wrestling. It could be a vehicle for comedy, a way to tell stories, hell, it could even be art. And together, the two resolved to change the world of wrestling. Oh, man. oh no, this is interesting. So it's literally going in as actors and then pulling out as people who are actually doing something. I just realized the context of what I just said with a bunch of guys in loincloths and not much else out there is probably not the right way to phrase that. Uh, <laughs> joy. Mega uproots his entire life and moves to Japan Damn. to be closer to Ibushi. And rather than become rivals, they form a tag team, initially being pitched as the Golden Brothers, but Omega and Ibushi prefer the name the Golden Lovers. The Golden <laughs> Lovers are on a level few other tag teams can even approach. There's a kinship Damn. and synchronicity here that fuels their matches. That's actually impressive. But what's more, they seem genuinely delighted to be around each other, both in the ring and outside it. And that chemistry shows in their exceptional teamwork and performances, with the Japanese audience embracing them wholeheartedly as they capture multiple tag titles. And by 2011, it feels like their dream is beginning to come true. Why, why did you have to phrase it that way? Well, wh why? Why would you phrase it? It feels like it's about to come true. Why do you? Oh, no. What happened? Who died? Wait, 20, 2011. Wasn't that? Uh, oh, that's the Sunap. No, 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 don't tell me. I, I'm wrong. I have to be wrong. I'm, there's no way this is the Fukushima tsunami aspect of the nuclear disaster. There's no way that's part of it. No, <laughs> I'm reading too much into this. I'm reading, the no. Golden Lovers are inseparable and they are changing. It'd be something stupid, and easy fix. But slowly, a gap starts to form between the two. While Koda only needs to rely on his God-given natural talents, Kenny often struggles, having to work hard to overcome his own weakness and to keep pace with Ibushi. 
and he starts to feel outpaced by his genius partner. Coda's genius doesn't go unnoticed either. He's being given more opportunities as a single wrestler, and what's more, he's winning. And with each victory, Kenny feels a little more left behind. And so on August 18th, 2012, after three years of partnership, the two face each other. And what he's probably describing is more just a mix of the story and actually the narrative they're given, huh? Because it wouldn't lead up to a fight if they weren't actually scripting part of it. But when he's talking about how it's overlapping, it's probably also bringing in the fact that he is pulling away and this is how they're splitting them up with an actual fight. And I don't know how they want to play that off. Is they're trying to build him up, so they're probably going to make sure he wins. But maybe they'll make it look closer to show that he's not completely outclassed yet. Hmm. Interesting. Also, I'm just glad it wasn't actually about any other natural disasters that happened then. I'm just going to pretend it had nothing to do with that and definitely wasn't that year because I don't remember what happened, so I'm just assuming I'm wrong. Really glad it wasn't actually that way. Usually when I assume the worst on the internet, it's usually right. And this is a nice change of pace. And what follows is one of the most spectacular matches in history. Kota fighting for his pure love of wrestling and Kenny desperately battling as to not be left behind by the person he cares about the most. But it's not enough. He cannot overcome the wrestling. Yes, Ibushi. punches, of course. And afterwards, both wrestlers look devastated. Kenny for the loss and Kota for having inflicted it upon him. Over the next two years, the gap between the two would only continue to widen. Ibushi continues to rise, even going so far as to face the legendary king of strong style, Shinsuke Nakamura. But meanwhile, is Kenny jacket. struggles without his former partner, gaining only modest wins and racking up several major losses, including one especially crushing defeat at the hands of Prince Devitt, a member Ooh. of the villainous Bullet Club, a vicious faction of American wrestlers who spit in the face of Japanese pro wrestling over Of course that's just Yeah, that makes sense the American villain of course named after a bullet that is very American I'll give him that one overwhelming opponents with their superior numbers and brutal tactics and the experience changes Omega he can't help feel that now without Ibushi by his side he is alone but Devitt has an entire army of allies behind him and so a realization dawns on him maybe with the bullet club he could finally become strong enough to stand as an equal with abushi and so two weeks later and this is part of the narrative where they're actually pulling him apart to build up this plot line of how he's coming to try and rival his friend again it's literally the corruption arc they're getting down here followed by a fight that's going to happen to bring them back together after he probably loses again or he finally wins it can go either way also, they're very much going full Matrix in the style here. Oh, my. He emerges as their newest member. And it works. He wins and he keeps winning. Until the day finally comes when his mentor and leader... Yeah, okay. So that's the part that's all the narrative right here. It's not just the talent. That's definitely being played up. But at the same time, really good storytelling. Just like growing together, having the separation of the talent... Is this basically Naruto? Oh god, it's Sasuke and Naruto. I hate everything about this, but at least there's no there's no Boruto, so at least there's that. Of the Bullet Club AJ Styles faces Koda for the IWJP Heavyweight Championship. In typical Bullet Club fashion, Kenny was expected to sabotage Ibushi. But he can't. He holds back for the entire match until its final moments, when Ibushi scales the turnbuckle and is seconds from victory, only to turn his head and see Kenny standing on the ring apron and the two lock eyes. And Kenny becomes paralyzed between his loyalty for the Bullet Club and his feelings towards his former partner, and so fails to act. But this momentary distraction is just enough time for Styles to recover, and he counters Ibushi's attack for a crushing comeback defeat. Afterwards, Omega is visibly shaken, while Ibushi lies devastated both by the loss and the betrayal of his former partner. This is just good writing, man. Again, maybe not the form I like, but I can see why people like this. This is very good writing. It's good storytelling, and 
the movements are so fast. Even when you can tell that they're holding off or like avoiding just by the skin of their teeth or knowing how to hit in such a way that the force is distributed, they're very good physical actors. I'm actually incredibly impressed. Not long after, Ibushi disappears from the Japanese wrestling scene, what? while Omega only continues to grow more ruthless, vicious, and victorious. And he begins to dominate New Japan. And that's probably the point where they're going to bring him back in, because now is the time for resurgence of the hero to beat down the corruption arc. Calling it. Shrouding himself in the indestructible armor of the Bullet Club and even deposing Styles as its leader, taking the crown for himself. This new invincible Kenny Omega even makes it to the very final of the G1 climax. Also, I'd like to point out that the Bullet Club is like the American villains, and he's Canadian. <laughs> I'm sorry, just... The irony here is that the perception of Canadians from America is kind, polite. Maple syrup. And for every American out there, you know I'm right. That's exactly how everyone in America thinks about Canada and in general. Is it right or wrong? Of course it's wrong. But it's very much the common misconception. The most elite wrestling tournament in the entire world. But his conquest has taken its toll, and he enters the match battered and exhausted, facing the immovable and dangerous Hiroki Goto, who punishes Omega again and again, constantly pushing him to the brink of defeat. And as the light of victory begins to fade away, Omega reaches deep down inside himself and what he finds is his old partner Ibushi, whose finisher, the Shining Star Powerbomb, he uses in a final sequence of moves to overcome Goto and take the win. And so finally that would be a he's comeback. done it. He's the best in the world. But without Ibushi by his side, how much does it actually mean? This inner conflict is only made worse when a year later Omega suffers a crushing loss in the finals of the same tournament. And afterwards, backstage, comes face to face with Ibushi for the first time since his betrayal. And Ibushi reaches out to comfort Omega, but Kenny cannot accept it. Things have gone too far. It's too late. And slowly, the unbreakable armor Omega has surrounded himself in begins to crack and crumble. And in the overarching narrative, that's basically saying, wow, they really went with this guy's hair. I didn't know people unironically did that. I thought that was just like an anime trope. Please tell me he's some kind of over-the-top German. That would be too perfect and so horrible. I would love it and hate it at the same time. But yeah, his narrative is basically, okay, he rose to the top by forsaking his friend and betraying it all. And then the climax, he got that moment to reflect use his famous friend's last move to win. And then it was all downhill from there after he got exactly what he wanted and broke everything. Again, the narrative arc is really good. And sensing weakness, the other members of the Bullet Club begin to turn on him, with the American nightmare Cody Rhodes using his feelings for Ibushi as a weapon against him, culminating in a savage attack on Koda, only to have Omega furiously defend his former partner. This eventually leads to the Bullet Club turning on Kenny, destroying him with a vicious assault, only for Ibushi to run to the ring and save his former partner. Ha! Called and it. then, in a moment that's been 10 years in the making, How long the did two they finally this for? just stand in the ring and face one another. Ibushi, desperate to reform their partnership. But it's just oh, Because he was a villain late. in this arc, yeah. Too much has happened, and the scars run too deep. Omega cannot accept his former partner. Until. <laughs> They're literally hugging it out. Oh my. After a story 10 years in the making, the Golden Lovers are reunited. What's so incredible to me about the saga of the Golden Lovers is that it's a story that could only really occur in wrestling. One that's about two people who felt a connection and formed something beautiful, only to later be torn apart by the different directions life. I take back what I said about being Naruto. It's definitely better than Naruto's storyline with Sasuke and him, but it's basically the same plot, just done better. Pull them in, and then finally, years later, to realize what really mattered. 
And what's more, identifying I can see why people what's get real the here and what isn't is nearly impossible. Omega was genuinely a young wrestler who was inspired by a videotape of Ibushi. Ibushi's talent oh, that part was actually Shine real? Omega, and the two were genuinely caught between their love of competing together huh. and their aspirations as single wrestlers. And as a result, there's a heart and a strife to this story that's so genuine and real. And I think at its best, that's what wrestling can be. See, that actually is really fascinating to me, how they learn to blur the line. And I wish he would go into more detail about that specific aspect. How much did they know in advance? How much got permission? How much did they ad-lib? How much did they ad-lib and people rolled with it or then punished them for not doing it? How many of those twists and turns became twists and turns because they were being punished like Triple H was or because things just happened to go a certain way or they, maybe they made a mistake. Someone actually got knocked out by accident. That last one I don't know happens too much because they seem incredibly good at what they do, but I'm sure it's probably happened. Yes, it's fake, but that doesn't mean it can't be honest. It doesn't mean its stories can't be about real things that we can all relate to. This is why I'm still a fan, why so many people yeah. are, and why I think at least that professional wrestling is fascinating. That was just cool. I... It was still pulling in some of the darkness that he gets in a lot of his other videos. Super High Patch Wolf did that. He showed how someone got punished for that moment of reality on TV. And for years, with if his sales are not relevant to his pay, it's a little less impactful. But if his draw for an event is directly related to the pay, Triple H got fucked for four years, paying his due of saying, hey... We're going to say goodbye to our friend and then they just screwed him over and then wrote it into the script or at least put it in a way that he could play with it at that point. I don't know how that came up. I want to know more of how these things happened. What kind of compromises were made? Who was involved in this? I'm looking at this going, this is a great overview and I want more, which is also really good because I know he's done a lot more of these. So I'm probably just going to check those out because there's a lot of wrestling vids he's done, apparently, which I didn't realize until I Googled Super High Patch Wolf Wrestling and saw there are a lot. So I got more to go through. I'm not sure which one comes next, though. So if anyone knows, tell me down below in the comments. Go on my Discord and show me the link because I'm me. I will forget everything. It, it's a thing. I, I'm aware. But yeah, I'm going to check it out because I want a documentary on this. I want to go into the detail. And if there's more videos, he probably does. So I'm just excited because... I just really liked this a lot more than I expected. It was wholesome. It was fun. And it showed how they were successfully blurring the line between fact and reality. So that even if it's fake, they brought in enough real elements that they could tell a story believably because they knew exactly what elements of truth could bleed through. And then when they didn't intend to, they also made mistakes. It were really good drama. And I just, I want more. So we're going to do that. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next one. And if you can, drop a link below to the, well... Drop a link in my Discord or the name of the next video for Super Eye Patch Wolf to do with wrestling because there's so many I need to know which one it is. Thanks. I'll see you guys then. Adios.